So I added some feelers to my basket so I can see them in my uh, side view mirrors so I know how far I am from, you know, the car behind me when I'm backing into a parking spot. And I added some reflectors to it. So, there you go. Good morning. Today is Saturday, July... I don't know, about the 8th. And um, I'm leaving Jody's house. I'm headed toward Casper, Wyoming um, to find a place to camp. And then I will be going to uh, Yellowstone Park the next day. I've never been there before. And I wanted to show you Kitty. Kitty, say hi. Say hi. Nope. She's not happy. In fact, she's just mad. Oh, you're okay. This is better for you. You'll be cool. So, okay, we'll see you on the road. This is a historical marker that I found on my way out of Shadron, Nebraska. It says, perhaps no spot in Nebraska is so surrounded by historical and geographical landmarks as this one. Numerous landmarks of the period of the Indian Wars are visible from here. The site of a legendary battle between the Sioux and Crow Indians, Crow Butte, lies directly to the south. It was also a pioneer landmark for Indians, soldiers, and cattlemen. To the west are the Red Cloud Buttes. From those well-known buttes, one may see the town of Crawford to the east, Fort Robinson to the south, and the site of the Red Cloud Agency to the southeast. The escarpment stretching north from the buttes was also a prominent early landmark. Approximately half a mile northwest of this point is the site of the Treaty Tree. There in September 1875, while thousands of members of the Sioux Indian Nation looked on, the Allison Commission made an unsuccessful attempt to buy the Black Hills from the Indians. It was not until after the bloody campaigns of 1876 that the Sioux Commission headed by George Manypenny, succeeded in purchasing the area. The Cheyenne Outbreak on September 9, 1878, after a year of suffering on an Oklahoma reservation, some 300 northern Cheyenne Indians began a trek back to their homeland. Dull Knife's band of 149 Indians were captured and taken to Fort Robinson. For months, they refused to return to their hated reservation. Captain Wessels, commanding officer at Fort Robinson, imprisoned the Indians on an, in a log barracks and attempted to starve them into submission. Using the few weapons they had smuggled into the building, the younger warriors began the Cheyenne outbreak about 9 p.m. January 9, 1879. After a desperate running battle on the snow-covered parade ground, the Indians managed to follow the banks of the White River, scale the cliffs, and escape. Unable to find horses, the Cheyenne eluded pursuing troops for 12 days by heading northwest through the rough terrain of the Pine Ridge. Soldiers discovered their hiding place on Antelope Creek January 22nd, but the Indians refused to surrender. During the outbreak, 64 Cheyenne and two, 11 soldiers were killed. More than 50 were recaptured and several escaped. The number of casualties made the Cheyenne outbreak one of the major conflicts of the Indian Wars.
Look at this gorgeous outlook. I think you can see the whole state of Nebraska from here. See the cows? See they're a little spread out? Okay, never mind. See these cows here? Remember I was talking the other day about how they were grouped together? And see how these ones are spread out? A bunch of people in the comments said that they grouped together for two reasons. One is because there's a storm coming and one is to help keep the flies off each other's faces. Well, I also learned that flies become a lot thicker when a storm is coming. So both of those things make sense. Because the flies are thicker when a storm is coming, they use each other's tails to keep the uh, flies off their face. So, I just thought I'd share that with you. It was kind of cool. Large pioneer ranches were established in this region of Nebraska in the 1870s and early 1880s. Charles F. Coffey was one of these pioneers with ranch headquarters on Hat Creek in Nebraska and Rawhide Creek in Wyoming. By June 1886, the Fremont Elkhorn and Missouri Valley Railroad, later the Chicago and Northwestern, reached the present site of Harrison. On August 15th, Coffee shipped the first train load from Harrison to Chicago. Coffee siding, located here to avoid higher freight rates in Wyoming, became an important shipping point for Nebraskans. Wyoming ranchers also trailed herds here for shipment. Near the 1,023rd foot long siding, Coffee built seven cattle of pens. Cattle awaiting shipment were pastured on the Nibra Nib Neobrara River south of here, as many as three cattle trains each consisting of not less than 14 cars, were sometimes shipped at a time. Ranching continues as the major industry in Sioux County, but, developed a de but development of better roads and use of huge cattle trucks have reduced dependence on railroads. Sightings and pens used continuously through the 1940s were removed in 1958, and little remains to mark coffer coffee siding and the pioneer ranching activity it represented. Sorry about that you guys. My phone just told me welcome to Wyoming and suddenly the road got very rough. So obviously the roads here are not maintained as well as they are in Nebraska which is too bad since my van is so noisy. Teton Yellowstone National Parks and I'm going to Yellowstone. Yay! This reminds me of being at my cousin Vicki's house. She lives in a very small town in eastern Washington and from her um, back porch there you can see a train. I would guess it's about a quarter mile away and it's just such a beautiful peaceful view and um, seeing this train going through the um, I want to say desert but you know whatever this whatever you would call this type of um, land because this is what eastern Washington looks like. This is Lusk, Wyoming, which is population 1500. And I saw I think this is where I yep. Um, there was a sign that said they have a c 
covered wagon motel. I don't know if it's actual covered wagons, but I hope to see it and show you. Well, there it is on the right, and it's not uh, covered wagons, darn it. That would have been cool to see, kind of like the teepees, or what did they call those? That was the, what's the other word for teepees? Wigwam, the Wigwam Motel. Okay, that says Jira College. I have no idea what that is or what it means, but maybe this sign will tell us. In the early 1900s, when homesteaders flocked to eastern Wyoming, where agricultural opportunities seemed very promising, the Christian Church of Dayton, Ohio, organized a religious agricultural colony and college 14 miles west of Lusk and named the settlement Jira. Jira. I don't know how to say that. At the heart of the community was Jira College, a two-year liberal arts college and the first junior college in Wyoming. The cornerstone of the main and only college building, Wilkinson Hall, was laid on October 21, 1909. Classes were first held Okay, Margaret says it's Jira. Uh, classes were first held in January 1910, but not until July 1910 was Wilkinson Hall ready to receive students. Jira College had a small faculty, but offered classes in art, the Bible, English, ethics, German, Greek, Latin, mathematics, music, and psychology. The college also provided an academy or high school, which for a time was the only one available to area students. Students were expected to abide by strict codes of personal conduct and attend religious services. The town of Jira grew up around the college. From 1908 to 1920, nearly 100 people lived here. The business district included a bank, a couple of general stores, a hotel, a mill, a newspaper, a telephone company, and a garage. Jira's founders prohibited intoxicating liquors, cigarettes, gambling, and prostitution within the town limits. Because of the semi-arid climate was not conducive to the raising of crops and dry farming methods were not widely adopted, many farmers left the area by 1920. The lack of church support and the dwindling population resulted in the demise of Jira and Jira College. The college graduated its last class in 1920 and then closed its doors. By 1925, most buildings in Jira were either destroyed or had been sold to area residents. A few basic services remained but these two eventually withered away. The post office was discontinued in 1943. I assume that the college was right here.